Oh my god. <laughs> I went there last night. Okay. Are we good? Yes. All right. Um, so, can I call this uh, zoning commission meeting of Orange Township, October 15th, 2024? Can someone please do roll? Mr. McNulty. Here. Mr. Bellis. Here. Ms. Foster. Here. Mr. Peters. Here. Mr. Bob. All right, so we are meeting uh, to discuss a revision uh, to the Orange Township Zoning Resolution. Uh, I believe uh, Robin Duffy has prepared uh, some information for us. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Bella. So I think um, in a little bit kind of traditional staff report, I can prepare a little PowerPoint uh, so we can kind of go through and overview uh, the project since you all have last seen it. Uh, start there, uh, again, in a little bit of that traditional staff report. Uh, maybe have some time uh, for questions from the commission and uh, public comment, uh, if there is any. Uh, and then once we finish that, uh, we can kind of roll into more specifics. Uh, time permitting, I'd like to get through at least the, the first four articles uh, this evening. Uh, they aren't terribly needy, especially the, the first couple, so I think we should be able to tackle that. Uh, and then uh, on from there. Okay, proceed. <laughs> Okay, so this is the Orange Township Zoning Code update. Uh, so this project officially kicked off uh, well over two years ago now, uh, in January 2022. Uh, so we've gone through multiple, multiple iterations of this. Uh, we first started uh, working with a consultant, uh, Zone Co. Uh, really in the last, uh, last leg of this race, we've kind of done most of this in-house. Um, so we've gotten to a point uh, where we are this evening where we're fairly happy uh, with the draft code. Uh, we did hold open houses uh, both in 2022 uh, and in 2023. Uh, so we did have some uh, in input from the public at uh, those uh, points as well. Uh, we sent out some uh, surveys, both electronic uh, and hard copy. Uh, and then we did have some work sessions uh, with you all, which you may remember uh, mm -hmm. earlier this year uh, to try to uh, capture your feedback as well. So over the, the summer, um, and as we've gone into the early fall, uh, we've tried to uh, update uh, the zoning code, uh, the draft code, based on uh, all those comments, as well as uh, just kind of further thinking about things uh, as, as staff uh, to try to get to where we are today. So uh, again, as you may recall, this was an action that you all uh, did to kick off the process on September 10th. Uh, so this is our first first official hearing uh, on the matter. Uh, Delaware County Regional Planning Commission uh, did uh, hear this at their meeting on September 26th uh, and did recommend conditional approval. Uh, they did provide a, a number of comments which were uh, fairly detailed and, and fairly numerous. Uh, so I, I did provide those uh, to you all electronically. Uh, I don't know that we need to go through them in much detail tonight. They're mostly minor things that I think we can work out at the staff level, but if you all do have any questions about uh, their comments or suggestions, we can certainly go into those. Uh, but otherwise, I think we can kind of go section by section uh, would be the better way to review things. Uh, so again, tonight, I meant just to give an overview of this process, um, allow for some public comment, uh, and then dive into the code for the first few articles. Uh, Robin, before you get yep. started, just real quick, the uh, group that we originally went and contracted to assist in that, so are they still actively involved with it or are their portion is done? So uh, we essentially have them on retainer. Uh, okay. They're not actively working with us right now, but we do have a contract uh, with them that's still valid. We still have money appropriated, so if we, if we need them uh, and we feel like we need that outside expertise, uh, we, we can pick back up where we were with them, uh, but again, kind of the last several rounds we've done in-house, just we yeah. feel that Zoneco gave us the, the bones of a good product, um, but ultimately, uh, as the uh, people who live uh, and who work in uh, the township on a daily basis, we kind of felt that we knew the code best uh, and felt what adjustments, uh, we felt we knew what adjustments needed to be made at this point. One additional question is, um, at the a conclusion of the draft, will there be a, a zone code or something similar? But because I understand they work with various mm -hmm. agencies around, I guess, the nation, 
where there may be new things or new zoning or even new things that are here in Ohio, that there'll be a, a sweep or at least a review of that just to see if there's any final maybe recommended changes. It's, it's something we could do. Okay. Yeah. I, it's something I recommend. Sure. So. I think they have incorporated quite a few of the newer trends that yeah. we'll, we'll discuss throughout the article too. So. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, so where, where we'll be going, uh, again, this is a, a zoning amendment like any other, so it's the, the same format uh, and process. Uh, so again, this is something that uh, instead of an applicant initiating a zoning change, this was initiated by uh, you all at the uh, September meeting. Uh, and then from here on out, it's like any other zoning change. So it first went to regional planning, now it comes before you all. Uh, you will hold hearings, uh, issue your recommendation, and ultimately it will go, will go to the Orange Township Board of Trustees, uh, and then they will also hold their hearings uh, until they finally approve or deny, hopefully approve uh, the, the code that we have. <laughs> Again, uh, this is probably the first of several meetings. Uh, I don't have an exact number uh, for um, how many meetings this will take, but it will depend on the uh, speed and the level of detail that we want to get down to. Uh, but again, uh, likely first of several this evening, so we're not looking for a, a vote on this this evening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Unless you all read the 270 pages that I have. Just check. <laughs> On one more procedural item, uh, because this is just something to keep in mind, because this is a zoning amendment and you're not anticipated to make a recommendation today, the Zoning Commission should basically continue the uh, zoning amendment unless and until you're ready to make that recommendation. So um, at the end of this here, or at the end of this evening, once you've kind of had your, your fill, um, it would be a motion to continue to your, your next regular meeting or um, yeah, just a to motion to the table schedule. or absolutely okay, and then we can schedule the next um, meeting. So, that right. so I, I would not, I wouldn't table it because then the township would have to republish notice and okay. that sort of Got thing. It. So okay. again, if continue you continue us. it, um, okay. time date place certain. All right, and Sean again, a couple more slides. Oh. I don't know why it didn't show. Okay. Oh, I wanna, sorry. All right. Um, so I did want to go over some changes since uh, the beginning of this year when, when we did the work sessions with you all uh, because we have retooled some things. In general, I'd say the, the content is fairly similar. Uh, obviously, we, we have changed uh, certain smaller things. Uh, but in terms of big strokes, we, we are changing uh, an approach uh, to how we're doing this. Uh, so I do want to talk about that up front. Um, so in going over this uh, idea, so initially we had kind of conceived this as, okay, the township is made up of a lot of plan districts, which are, as you all know, are essentially unique uh, zoning districts that are unique to a certain property or a certain set of properties. Uh, at the outset of this process, we were hoping to kind of standardize those to essentially um, start with a clean slate and roll those into new straight districts. Uh, as we got further down the line, we kind of realized that uh, that approach maybe was not the right one uh, and that there were going to be a lot of hurdles to clear uh, with that approach. Uh, so I think we've kind of again, just change the way that we're approaching this. Uh, so due to those complexities, we're not looking to rezone uh, existing property. Uh, so that's where we are today. So if something is uh, zoned plain commercial today, it's going to stay uh, plain commercial. If something is zoned uh, single family plain residential, it will stay single family plain residential. Uh, there's, again, just a, lo a lot of reasons for that, a lot of complexities. Uh, and frankly, was called new territory uh, for uh, a lot of us and for property owners. So the way we're conceiving this now, uh, we still want to create new districts. We want to kind of reshuffle our districts. Um, and we'll, this new code will create the new districts and then property owners can request rezonings to those districts over time, uh, rather than us as the township initiating a township-wide rezoning, which really could just have a lot of unintended consequences. 
Uh, so we felt this kind of more incremental approach would probably uh, be better for everybody in the long term. So does that mean a property owner has a choice of staying with their existing zoning or moving into the new zoning code? Correct. Okay. It will stay automatically. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the, the actual map, and I'm so sorry, the, the map will not change. Um, so know that the districts are actually changing. Oh, I'm so sorry. Thank you. The uh, the map itself won't change, just the resolution. Yeah. Will the um, you know, in the case of a homeowner, will, will they be limited though to only the next district to them versus they becoming a hodgepodge in you know, various districts? I, there's not any geographical restrictions, um, but again, that would and that would be more where the comprehensive plan comes in. That you know, that is the kind of guided policy document that tells us what a property should be and what an area should be. Okay, and so that is the reason. The first thing I noticed is that there was no map that sort of went along Correct. with this, and I assume that is the reason why. Yes. Is that because we're not really. Yeah, so uh, changing the existing. Yeah. Yes, and Delaware County Regional Planning is working on updating our, our map. But okay. None of the no properties on the map will be changing. Uh, but we'll, what will change is that little legend next to the zoning map that says what districts are there and what districts are available so they will be updating that. Okay. Taking out the planned districts, does this alleviate the far out problem that we heard that? Hey, it can all be rezoned, and all those special considerations for a lot of those planned districts would have to be redone. Does that alleviate? It, it I think it does, um, because all those. So, for example, whenever um, when uh, plan district comes in, uh, the trustees and the zoning commission has input on this as well. But the trustees have the ability to put conditions on uh, that plan district, uh, and so. Uh, Part of the concern was if we rezone those properties, then all those conditions would disappear. And so this would preserve that until the property owner comes in at a future date and says, I want to rezone to something else. Okay, this is already preserves what has already been written, approved, done, what's in your file cabinets. Correct. Okay, so there's no fear out there. Although, again, I thought those were kind of not going to happen, but they existed that people are going to come in and ask for rezoning. Okay? Correct. So you were fixed, helped to fix the problem. Or potentially. <laughs> potentially, yeah. Hopefully. But when they come to rezone, those conditions that were previously there were also clear on, on the... So it, it, de it would depend on how, it would depend on how they do it. Um, so if, if there was a, a plan and Truly, please correct me if I misspeak. But if there's a plan district that comes in in you know, five years from now uh, that wants to rezone, then that would be kind of starting fresh from uh, from okay. their perspective. So they would have to follow uh, the the guidelines of the district that they are rezoning to, or they could uh, rezone to another plan district and then have conditions set uh, on that. Okay. Okay. Or, and the existing conditions won't come. Yeah. Won't carry over the existing condition. No, they, won't carry they, they over. Would not. Unless you make an amendment to that existing okay. I see yes. district. Yeah, yeah. that's gonna be not too many. <laughs> well, that's what we do now. Yeah. I'll be honest. <laughs> so and the the third kind of pathway for someone would be to so I think you said amend the existing uh, plan, mm -hmm. um, create a new planned district or three rezone to one of your straight districts that you're creating here, which a straight district is basically a box. It's, um, you know, here's the criteria. If you need it, you don't need to come into the township necessarily, that sort of thing. So those would be the, the three pathways. A district in a box, mm -hmm. whatever you need. Mm -hmm. If it's not there, it's not intended to be there. If it's there, mm -hmm. you need it, use it. Yep. So nobody could come in and say we want the Lewis Center plan district zoning, which was essentially was grandfather in, and that originally was a district that couldn't happen today. Yeah, and and so I let's put a pin on that, Dennis, because okay. Lewis Center Village is its own can of worms. It is. I, yes. I will come back to that um, on I think on the next slide actually. Okay. Um, <laughs> so hold that thought. Um, but that does lead us kind of into our next bullet point. Uh, 
final bullet point on this slide, uh, which is, uh, so again, we, we're setting up straight districts, and then the other change uh, is that separate categories uh, for plan districts uh, will be disappearing, and instead we'll have one catch-all uh, plan unit development district. So currently, the way we have it set up and the way that we've all seen it done in Orange Township for 30 plus years is that there's different categories for plan districts. There's single family plan district, there's multi-family plan district, there's you know plan commercial, there's plan industrial, there's all those different boxes. This uh, would get rid of those uh, and then create one catch-all. So the idea is if somebody's rezoning, they can do it to a straight zoning district, which hopefully would capture the majority of rezonings. Mm -hmm. But if somebody felt that their plan uh, didn't fit into any of those boxes, then they can do it. They can still do it through a plan district, uh, and it, but it would be one all-encompassing zone uh, rather than the, the different categories that we have. Okay, so that would have been like, let's say, Evans Farm, we had to put into a basket, right. and yeah. it really didn't quite fit perfectly in a basket. Now we could say, oh, this is going to be a new district, it's going to be a planned unit development, but it'll be what, you know, we agree, mm -hmm. or the community agrees is going to be in that Correct. district, and it's not going to be, has to be one or the other, it can have its own definition. Yeah. Okay. Do we have any other questions, or can we move on? Sorry, no, good conversation. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> all right. Um, so, in the last draft that you all saw, uh, we had some districts that we've uh, now eliminated from the draft, um, such as the uh, proposed Evans Farm districts. So, again, this was when we were conceiving of it as we're going to wipe away all those currently existing plan districts. So, we came up with a, a new Evans Farm zone. Uh, that had, you know, we tried to mirror the standards uh, from Evans Farm, uh, mm -hmm. but we realized, okay, if we're just going to keep the Evans Farm plan district as it is, then we don't need that anymore, uh, so it's no longer in the text. Uh, the Parks and Open Space District, uh, we also had in there originally, again, this was when we were conceiving, uh, you know, rezoning every property in Orange Township, uh, which we are no longer going to do. And so we, at first we thought, okay, maybe it's a good idea to have a parks and open space zone, uh, but then thinking that parks are permitted almost everywhere, uh, and so who is going to rezone to a park district? Uh, and so the, the thinking was, well, if it's not going to, to get utilized, then maybe it just shouldn't be in the code. Okay. So you Parks would be removed from the code if so, repeat. <laughs> so we had a we had a standalone parks uh, zoning yes, district yes. Uh, that again that that zoning district has been removed. That doesn't okay. mean that parks can't be in Orange Township. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the parks as a use are still allowed uh, almost in every district, okay. but uh, in terms of a, a unique zone that a park would go to. Uh, we, we didn't really okay. see the need for okay. that. Route 23 overlay went away? That is the next bullet point. Is. I know. Yeah. I was looking at that and Sorry. I was like, well, my mouth dropped. I tried to I was, skip it. I, 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 I thought you were trying to skip it real quick. No, no. I'm next, sorry. I didn't. It's, it's, <laughs> let's not talk about that. You know, just on the, on the park thing, is there, a, you know, I don't know if the Board of Trustees or Township itself scouts out areas for potential park? themselves and, and make a declaration of so. so and to me it seems like you're giving up a a potential key to help shape your township as uh as people continue moving in. well I, so i think the idea is that uh because parks would already be allowed in basically any district that's existing there wouldn't be a need to rezone it so okay. uh, and we'll just have a very hypothetical example. Say there's a planned commercial uh, property that's zoned planned commercial currently that, uh, you know, for whatever reason, Orange Township uh, is able to pay commercial development type money uh, to acquire this property that's zoned planned commercial and we want to put a park there. Well, the a park would be permitted already, so the township is not going to go through the extra step of changing the zoning district to allow for a park when it would already be permitted. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So on a similar vein, 
and I don't know um, how feasible it is, but I'll just throw it out there. Um, something like a, a conservation district, because I know um, a lot of people are concerned, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, with, um, you know, the fact that, you know, farmlands disappearing throughout the region, throughout the country, is it worthwhile to have something like that? Or just to just do it as like a plan? Yeah, so uh, at that. In, in general, uh, zoning is typically not the vehicle to, to conserve land. I mean, it, it could mm -hmm. be. Uh, it could be that they could create a, a plan district that essentially removes any development uh, possibilities from that land, and that would kind of be an extra layer of protection. Generally, uh, conservation easements are the, are the, the typical exactly. mechanism. Uh, for how that's accomplished. Or land banks or something like that. Correct. So, yeah. And so those are done with, with third parties and not necessarily regulated for okay. So that could just be like a, um, a new district that could be created to help further protect something like that if it does occur. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Works for me. <laughs> All right. Uh, so going back to the Lewis Center Village District. Um, so incorporating the feedback that you all gave earlier this year because I, I think there was some concern from the commission that uh, you know somebody in the the southeast quarter of the township could look at those Lewis Center Village standards and think I want those standards for my property and that we wouldn't have any uh, ability to control that uh, so we we changed the way that uh, we look at the Lewis Center Village district so we went from having it be a straight zone uh, to turning it into an overlay zone uh, because our, our goal for the Lewis Center Village District uh, is to you know, make a zoning code that's reflective of what's there already and allow uh, property owners in that area to be able to uh, build what they want to you know, within reason uh, mm -hmm. without going through uh, a million variances. Uh, and so our approach to that one is to have it be an overlay uh, district because that allows them to have somewhat of a streamlined process it limits it geographically. So if you look in the text, uh, we do have a map that specifically outlines what parcels are in that overlay district. Mm -hmm. And so only those park property owners uh, can request that uh, the standards be applied to their property. So it limits it geographically. Uh, it's still it's still one hurdle to, to jump over for them that you know maybe somebody uh, with a, a two acre lot half a mile down the road wouldn't have to go through, but it's less onerous again than going through uh, 13 variances uh, through the BCA. Mm -hmm. So that, that's our suggestion for that approach. Perfect. Yeah. 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 Um, and then, uh, as you'll see, so various formatting and section renumbering changes. But truthfully, I liked the version that uh, was presented to you all earlier in the year. There were fewer sections, uh, and it was a little less jumbled. Uh, we are still working on some formatting uh, and numbering issues, so bear with us through that. Uh, it, the final product will look better than what you have in front of you right now. Uh, but we we kind of had to uh, just reshuffle uh, a lot of the, the content um, from where it was. And a lot of this is because there are existing plan districts that refer to uh, Article 21, which is the general development standards, or Article 22, uh, which is signage. Uh, and so it kind of, it seemed that the best way to preserve those references is to keep all the general development standards in Article 21 and all the signage standards in Article 22. Uh, so uh, it's not the most user friendly, uh, but I think it's, it's the best way to uh, accomplish our goals and can still have, a, I think, a more cohesive document uh, than what we have currently. So that's why it, Initially, uh, what you saw early in the year was I think eight or nine section or eight or nine articles, and now we're up to you know, we're back up to 29. Uh, there's some blank sections in there. Uh, it, again, it, it looks a little odd, but I I, I promise you there is a method to our guidance. And the Route 23 corridor overlay went away. You know, I guess I'm curious is that is that something that Zone Co or some other through discussions said. This needs to go, you need to do something else because that was originally put there for just ease, speed right. of access. Here it's simpler, people come in, 
So, gone. Well, I, I mean, we are proposing it to be gone. Um, the trustees recently set a moratorium on the overlay district as they haven't been happy with the applications and the outcomes of it. And, and in their opinion, they're not a fan of the way that, that streamlined process occurs. So that's why a moratorium is in, in place and we recommended removing it. Um, I think that was a, what when we, because I was, we were all part of it. I mean, I think there was good intent at the beginning of it um, because we didn't have districts to work off of. Our planning process took several months. We wanted an opportunity to get them from start to finish line in a, in a you know, less than 60 days. Okay. Now we're at a position with, with Robin on board and just new leadership and administration that we, we are moving applications at a much quicker speed. No so yes. we don't think there is a necessarily a need for the overlay okay. district. Because, and it does surpass the zoning commission and the trustees really rely heavily on your opinion. And your recommendation isn't formalized in this overlay district so uh we want we wanted to get the board wanted to get rid of that so all right i think okay. that's fine mm -hmm. uh, Ronnie, just a question of uh, uh, education here you know this, since this is a draft version of what have you any reason you don't market this draft or is it the fact that it's... Uh, sorry Les, what was the question is there any reason you don't mark these documents as draft or this, this is a draft, right? It is a draft. Yeah. yeah. So just so that, you know, whenever we work with the draft version number two or number three or whatever. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll number them as we go forward. I don't know if it was in the version that I uh, printed out or sent to you all, but at least in the electronic version that, that I have, I got a draft watermark okay. in there uh, okay. just so that, that that's clear. Okay. No. I may have removed it just to make it easier for you all to read. No, <laughs> Thank you for doing this. Yeah. All right, so that's all I have at this point. I, I know you all have been asking questions uh, throughout, which is great. Uh, but if you all have any more questions or, or comments, uh, I'd say now is the time maybe for some general discussion um, and maybe some public comment members of the public. No, good job, Bob, and I, I like what, good job, well, I like the changes that were made. Yeah, um, was this um, slide deck be available to the public who is not attending, so is it going to be like on a website or something, so if people cannot attend the meeting, they'll have access to some of this? Um... We, yeah, we can absolutely put it on our Google Drive, uh, which has a reminder to everybody, all our rezoning applications are available online, it's kind of have to click through our website a little bit um, is on Google Drive there. Uh, and as a reminder to any public who is in attendance or watching at home, uh, all our meetings are streamed on YouTube and available for viewing at a later date uh, if you feel like re-watching Zoning Commission meetings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just for, for Zoning Commission Board of Zoning Appeals and Board of Trustees Zoning Hearings uh, and Board of Trustees regular meetings uh, are all available online. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm assuming, does the commission have any general comments they want to make right now? Um, no, not having perhaps is a little challenging to go through each one of them. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I, I hope we will get it in the next draft maybe. Okay. And uh, some of the comprehensive dimensional standards and all that makes it very clear having them all in one page, two pages. It's very easy to refer to this one. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. no, I was just going to say, I think the process has been a Good process, but also a learning one, right? Because of yes. uh, it's taking a little longer than we, we anticipated. Yeah. Um, uh, one of my just general questions for you, and I don't know if it's appropriate for you to answer or not, but um, the company that we worked with, um, please, overall, or? Yeah, I, I mean, it seems yeah. like we, as I think you said, they gave you a good framework to work in in the building, and then you were able to take on some of that, presuming saving the township some money, so kudos on that perspective. And then, if you need them for more, but yeah. I mean, and it, again, uh, you know, we're we're pleased with the work that Zoneco did on this. I, I think part of it too is uh, Zoneco is they're a nationally recognized firm uh, for for what they do, which is great work with zoning codes. They do work with a lot of cities uh, and and municipalities, uh, both in Ohio and, and nationally. Townships in Ohio are a, a different beast, uh, both in terms of 
the you know the unique challenges that we have in terms of the powers that we have, uh, but also just in terms of uh, what state law says we can and can't do. Um, and Ms. Don has been very helpful uh, in going through and, and kind of recognizing where we need to tweak some things uh, based on state law. So again, it's it's kind of that that local expertise that we have. Uh, we just felt like you know the township staff uh, can do the rest of this uh, in house. But we are grateful for uh, the work that SoCo has done on this project. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Yes, I appreciated your updates. As you saw, I brought the last binder with me. <laughs> <laughs> I have not even really gone through this version of it other than the old binder. So I have a little work to do. Did we have an opportunity going forward on the dimension standards to have a more lengthy discussion? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, so my, uh, um, again, my, my goal is, uh, you know, we can, I would like to go through every article with you all. Uh, that doesn't mean that we'll go through line by line necessarily. Uh, I would encourage you all to, to, you know, you don't have to give it as much of an extremely detailed read, but at least go, go through the, try to go through the articles ahead of time, you know, maybe just highlight some things that stand out to you if you'd like to discuss them. And I'm going to do the same, uh, so I'll just basically pull out uh, sections that, uh, you know, I, I think would be of particular interest, uh, or that would be new or different. Uh, try to, to flag those, uh, but I, I do want to go through each article as it comes uh, because we are rewriting 271 pages of, of law, uh, <laughs> so it's important to be thorough. Yeah, yeah. But we're not changing existing zoning. Dennis, do you have anything you want? No, I'm good. Uh, I'm good too. So. Um, since we have like a sort of a brief, I don't call it a break, but a transition, uh, it's nice to see members of the public here uh, involved in uh, the rezoning process. So if there is anything uh, you want to address um, now that we're starting this process, any concerns that you have, feel free to come up before the commission, just state your name and address uh, for the record, uh, and that way we uh, um, we could get your comments on the process. <laughs> My name is Richard Kite. I live at 326 Parkgate Court in the courtyards of Clear Creek. We're here because we're very interested in what you're going to have on your agenda next week. And we're a week early. I think most of the people here are from Clear Creek. Uh, okay. One of the neighbors got a, a notice that confused them, thought something was happening tonight. Not knowing you lovely people, not knowing the staff very well, <laughs> not trusting the developer, we thought something was happening before we were ready for it. Now that we see you're perfectly honorable, <laughs> and Robin is very efficient, Yeah. We're good to go. Okay. We will see you next week. Okay, right. that is fine. Well, uh, we appreciate you being here. Yes, <laughs> and, and if you have any questions, uh, Robin and the rest of the zoning staff, like you said, are very friendly and he great is, resources and can walk you through the process that you might have concerns about. Um, he's done that. He's been very responsive to anything that we've seen. Okay, yeah. excellent. <laughs> and so it sounds like we'll see you next week. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anyone else in uh, the public that would like to have a comment or make a comment about the rezoning process? Uh, Mark Freeman, 478 Glenside Lane. Uh, High Meadows, Green Meadows, Fox Ridge. Uh, I think we've we've seen a lot of reassurance about what's not changing. I haven't heard anything about what is changing. It seems like we're doing a lot of work. I mean, I have no doubt the amount of effort that, that went into this. But if the result is that nothing is changing for existing properties, um, I'm wondering if anybody can provide you know, a three paragraph uh, summary of what are we accomplishing with this? You know, what's, what's new? 
Perfect. I mean, I, I can take a general stab at it. I, I think, Mark, this is this is more. I would say the changes that we're making um, are significant, but for future development. I think it's it's very difficult to, to make changes to existing as it's already there. Um, we have a lot of plan districts that are various boards have approved to have certain specific set of conditions. So if we changed all the zoning, there would be all sorts of legal nonconformities. So the, the plans that we have in place for this new code, I, I would say high level is for future development. <laughs> I don't know if that helps. Mm -hmm. And redevelopment too. I mean, yeah, I think be. it's for from yeah. my understanding, and help me if I'm wrong. It's yeah. for uh, future development and, and redevelopment yeah. that our zoning code um, might have been fine like in, in the '90s, um, but it doesn't. It hasn't really kept up with the pace of development in the area and the types of development that are needed to to meet future demand. Um, and so we're sort of putting the framework now for the future. It's difficult to go back, like you said, and have to rezone and grandfather stuff in. Um, so there is a, um, which is what I thought, like I said, we had talked about yeah. originally doing, uh, but realize that there might not only be a lot of legal competition, uh, complications, but also perhaps resistance from people as well. So this is an easier way to accommodate the past with a look towards the future um, and so hopefully you know the new development will follow the new code or rezoning will follow the new code also to make it easier for our planning and zoning department so they don't have to go and look at you know every single planned use development and continue that process where every property or groups of property has its distinct zoning, mm -hmm. um, which makes yes, which makes uh, compliance and enforcement a nightmare. So we're trying to make things easy and more streamlined, also for our zoning departments, because okay. um, they have a tough job to begin with. Sorry. <laughs> well put, Mister. What was that? Well put. <laughs> Is there, are there any other uh, comments from the public as we, um, before we move into sort of the next phase of tonight's discussion? And again, we're always open or uh, definitely uh, Robin Duffy's uh, email door is always open for commentary uh, if you have concerns about the process for, you know, that part of this is we do want public comment in this process because this is for the community. This is the way that we can plan the growth in our community. And what I try to tell people is growth is going to happen, whether you like it or not. Uh, so the best thing to do is to plan for it and plan accordingly so you can see the type of development um, and the type of growth that you want for your community. All right, well, then I'm going to hand it back uh, to Robin if you want to um, take us through um, the various articles. I will be honest, I have not read the whole text yet? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that, uh, these first couple should be fairly simple. Uh, so it will kind of wet our whistle before we get into the things. Uh, so for Article 1, uh, Title, Authority, Purpose, Comprehensive Plan. Uh, title, Authority, and, and Purpose are, are fairly simple. It lays, you know, just lays out. <laughs> what zoning is in Orange Township, uh, how we have the uh, authority to do it, uh, and, and what it's for. Uh, again, I, I wanted to, to note just briefly uh, section 1.03, the, the comprehensive plan. Uh, again, that's our that's separate from the zoning resolution, so the, the comp plan is, is more prescriptive. You know, these are the rules that you have to follow. Uh, sorry, that, yeah. Say that right. The zoning resolution is more prescriptive. Uh, you know, these are the rules that you have to follow. And then the comprehensive plan is more aspirational. That's the, the guiding document. That's uh, what we consult when, you know, should this be planned commercial or should this be residential? Uh, guiding us in, in those decisions uh, and helping us to put those pieces together. And my understanding is they go hand in hand, that you need a comprehensive plan to establish the basis for your zoning code and sort of vice versa, that they zoning code is, you know, 
Yes. Um, we'll update that. Okay. Tomorrow after this, right? <laughs> 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 but that is the plan after the zoning code. You know, it, the pump plan was adopted in 2018. So, mm -hmm. as you know, try to look at it every five years or so. So, yeah. it's the season. Before 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just, just wanted to make sure. Sorry. That's okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's our goal. We're one thirty for the right there. Woohoo! Mm -hmm. All right. Um, I'm going to. I'm uh, sorry. I know that Robin. There was at least regional planning had one comment um, for Article One, the district boundaries. I didn't know if that was. I think that was maybe in two. Okay. Yeah, I thought that was. Just... Oh, maybe he just cited the wrong number. So oh. He cited 106C, which there is no 106C. Okay. Oh, sorry. No, never mind. 1.06C. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I will hold that comment then. Actually, I don't know where that is. Um, I guess we'll find it. It's a puzzle. Yeah, so I think that would be in article two. Okay. And again, I, I apologize. We we had difficulty formatting this document, so uh, we we did our best to try to make sure that all the the section numbers, uh, you know, indentation and, and fonts were correct. We didn't quite get there, uh, but we again the finished product will. Uh, be very orderly um, and look a lot better than what it is. AKA Microsoft Word isn't the friendliest. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, so Article 2 is the interpretations of the standards. Uh, so it's these can be kind of hard to conceptualize without concrete examples, but do have some provisions in here that uh, we want to flag on uh, some of these that uh, we will probably still look at. Uh, we'll start with 2.01c uh, discrepancy between provisions. Uh, read that. In the case of any conflict or inconsistency between two or more provisions of this resolution, uh, e.g., the restrictions set forth in overlay district versus the restrictions set forth in the base district. Uh, or any township, any other township kind of state or federal ordinance regulation or standard uh, provision which imposes the greater or higher or more restrictive standard shall. Mm -hmm. does, does that make sense to everybody? Yes, that yeah. yes that's, sense. that's yeah. standard for architecture as well yeah. uh, and code enforcement when it comes to building code. Julie, is that language seen as reasonable to you? I don't want to tweak that yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I might want to tweak it a little bit. To um, clarify, not just overlay in straight districts, but also with the general de development standards. But I think that understood on the kind of intent. Okay. Um, so the next section that I want to look at um, is 2.015e. Uh, so it's again the, the page numbers are not. Uh, 100%, so I, I'm going to refer to it by section numbers. Uh, but we're talking about the previous active districts. And again, this, this language may be tweaked a little bit. Uh, but this essentially says uh, because we're removing uh, certain districts uh, that we have currently, uh, you can uh, read them all there, but it's A1, R2, uh, R3, uh, SFPRD, MFPRD, C1, PCD, PERD, I, PI, uh, and RCOD. So basically it's saying, uh, while those are not uh, active in terms of the zoning resolution, uh, copies of their text uh, we'll have on hand uh, for reference purposes. Uh, people need them uh, and no applications uh, for rezonings to those districts uh, will be accepted by the township. So it's basically de declaring them defunct, uh, but saying, yeah. you know, we do have these if we need them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. So I did not realize, um, I all read it, but um, was there a discussion why we got rid of the planned elderly residential district? Because uh, I did know at one point that we had created it. My understanding was is to encourage um, 
want to say housing for the elderly or age-restricted housing, but to encourage that kind of development to give them in, uh, developers incentives. Yeah, so I, I think um, realistically any development that would utilize that zoning uh, would mm -hmm. fit under our new multifamily zone, which we're calling community living, okay. uh, or again, that uh, catch-all uh, PUD. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, so basically it's sort of been repackaged as community living. Basically. Okay. Or or just a general plan, you know, district is like the mm -hmm. SF, the RD, and, and mm -hmm. then PRD. Yeah, I was just yeah. curious because um, it had like a, uh, an incentive for developers and um, having worked with developers, I sometimes feel like they do not do um, or they do not promote the kind of growth you want unless you give them an incentive. Yeah, mm -hmm. like a particular, particular okay. area is designated for that only. Yeah, I mean, that's something we can look at when we talk I about mean, the community living district well, we'll just, too. Yeah, yeah, I think we can um, sort of move that conversation, like you said, to when we discuss the community living zone, and I haven't read that article yet, um, I'll be honest. So. Understood. <laughs> It'll be my home. Uh, so this is so section 2.03. This is where uh, that regional planning comment uh, came into play uh, with the district boundaries. And, and I think that's something that um, we can look at it at the, the staff level, uh, but we can uh, discuss it uh, if anybody would like to. Uh, so where district boundaries are so indicated that they're approximately parallel to the center lines or right of way streets. Or right of way lines or streets, the center lines or alley lines of alleys, or the center lines or right of way lines of highways, such district boundaries shall be construed as being parallel thereto, and at such distance therefrom as indicated on the map. If no distance is given, such dimensions shall be determined by the use of a scale shown on the zoning map. Uh, regional planning's comment was this is confusing. I tend to agree. <laughs> uh, so we, we can uh, look to uh, clear up that line. Mm -hmm. But I, I understand the intent of it, uh, which is you know, just trying to delineate clearly where where zoning districts begin and end. Uh, we do it's it's interesting here in the township. We have kind of two types of property lines that front public rights of way. One is where the property line ends at the right of way, and then uh, another type where the property line actually extends to the center line. Of Mm -hmm. uh, so this is just yeah. trying That's to, true. to, to yeah. clarify which one is the actual history. Yeah. 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 Understood, I assume. Mm -hmm. It can easily, well, perhaps not easily, but yes, just clarification. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 2.05, uh, so we've been uh, we had talked about this uh, in our work session some. Um, and Sean, I'm wondering if you can go down to the pages with the diagrams. Maybe two pages down. <coughs> Sorry, I'm just scrolling slow so in case anyone wants to pause this when they're watching. <laughs> uh, So this diagram in particular, uh, you know, we, we had discussed last time, uh, we kind of left it as it is, uh, but just want to point out, um, again, I think with the, the new way that we're doing this, it hopefully should not cause as much concern, where this is essentially saying, if there is a, a property on a corner uh, that fronts two rights of way, essentially they have two front setbacks uh, instead of a, you know, two sides on a front, uh, because that, Again, that setback would be from the road uh, and not from the side, which typically would be a little less stringent. Yeah, I think since we're not rezoning property, it's, it, the, there's less of a concern that it's going to create problems down the line, but I just want to make sure that you all are comfortable with that. Okay, well, actually that was my first question. Because um, um, like your figure uh, 2.05C, um, you have a street and a street. How do alleyways play in that? Because I know um, we originally had at Evans Farm sort of alleyways or not primary streets, but maybe you could, you could call them secondary streets. Um, so that is being grandfathered in, and then any future 
it's going to be considered a full street, so there's no be no alleys. Uh, so I think there there could be alleys. Uh, again, I think that would be like the ones in like where you go behind the house and yeah, yeah and park in the garage. garage. Yeah. But with if if you have yeah. a front yeah. setback, your rear setback's the same. So then you wouldn't necessarily in yeah. most lots do not have the capacity for a front and. Sure. Two front setbacks for a garage. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that came out correctly or not, but um, so I was. What is what is? How do we handle that? Mm -hmm. Or has there been thoughts? <coughs> I know Evans Farm is grandfathered in, but if anybody wanted to do something similar, I mean, I sort of like having maybe you know the utility in the back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and to taking your comment one step further, there could be a situation like Evans Farm, not mm -hmm. just, you know, you've got the front street, you have the alleyway, but someone could have a, if they're on the end, mm -hmm. they basically have three streets, and so potentially three front yard setbacks. Exactly. Um, so that's a fair. Um, or even, you could even make the case for something like Opera 23 and Gooding Boulevard, where you have Opera 23, they're now trying to go towards access roads mm -hmm. and not have as many curb cuts on 23. So then potentially you could have two public corridors accessing your property, um, which, you know, generally off of 23, a lot of those lots are pretty large, so it might not be an issue, but that would be something um 23 has a very large setback how to uh, accommodate development and define or be reasonable with if you have more than one public street yeah i think it's a good point uh i think i think the issue would be if uh for for alan specifically I think for private alleys, mm -hmm. it would be fine. But then, mm -hmm. uh, if there were to be a case where there were a public alley, I, I do think reading this language that it would trigger that. So I think. That might be okay. Sure. So if you could just. Yeah. Alternatively, uh, for redevelopment. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, if somebody is grandfathered into a certain thing and then something happened and they have to redevelop their house and they, and they are on the corner. Mm -hmm. There's not enough space for the front set back. Yeah, it's like you have to get a, a variance. Thank you for that. Yeah, that's great. Okay. So I have a question. Uh, so for um, 205B, the zoning inspector will determine setbacks for irregular shaped lots. I guess question for legal, if if it were to be challenged by whatever reason, they would go through like the appeal process through the Board of Zoning Appeals based on the zoning inspector's decision, is that? So I, I do, I've got a few comments of my own and that's something that I do think we need to flush out a bit. Okay. Um, because obviously there are, can be irregular lots or if there's a little, any number of things, but I, I think that the way it's written right now, um, if, if I'm a property owner and I read that, that to me means that there's ambiguity in the code and any ambiguity needs to be read in my favor, not up for, to Robin, for Robin to decide. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, but yeah, so that's something we can definitely kind of parse through a little bit more. Adding to that, what is irregular? Defining irregular is important because mm -hmm. if only a square or a rectangle is not irregular, there is like thousands of properties that are. Yeah, I think irregular. of it maybe more as like a corner lot. Like I know, depending on who reviewed the permit, some may see it on. Just an example, like some may see the front on this side, but the address was on this street. So determining, you know, there's been zoning inspectors in the past that would say. If the address is on this street, then these are actually two side yards. Um, I, I don't know. And then, you know, there are the, to your point, there's all sorts of shape lots too, and just trying to find. I mean, we have been challenged with it in the past. Uh, it's not, a, not that often. It's mainly if someone wants to build like a deck or a swimming pool that we don't really understand the setbacks at that point. Um, yeah, I, I do think where it gets particularly tricky to your point is uh, when it's on a cul-de-sac. Those are, those yeah, are or different. now that we have all these roundabouts, um, uh, that also are going to contribute to sure. irregularly shaped lots. <laughs> to, to Michelle's earlier point, in terms of where other 
Um, in the past, there have been interpretational issues. Um, she's exactly right, though, that if, if Robin were to say, look, I think that this deck or, or what, this is, your, this is your side yard, this is your front yard, this is the encroachment, um, Robin would make that determination. And if the property owner disagreed with his opinion, or with his determination, they could appeal that decision to the BZA. I almost think just because some standards, especially with respect to calling something a front yard that is always seen as a side yard forever, for the last hundred years, I think, you know, unless you're ready to do that battle, I think you give it up to tradition and leave it, call it a side yard. Because you're right, you're going to bump into just what Michelle said. You're already, that's, hey, we see that's the side yard. Yeah, I understand the right of way, I understand the road, why you want to call it front. But uh, I'd consider whatever those traditions and people who are out there already are. And then it gets to a point, though, where we have to, we have to, if we're going to take that approach, we have to have clear language about what is the front. Is it? Is it the address? Is it the elevation? Well, I had Robin, would, about that would, would, Robin whatever choice choice you make is the correct one. I'm only suggesting at least to consider it. And I'm not suggesting it has to be one way or the other. But <clears throat> well, like, I mean, whatever you call it. Well, that's what I was going to say. It would be the primary. Well, no, not necessarily the primary entry because the primary entry could be a garage. Right. It would be the primary face or the facade of the building. Your definitions, and we'll get through that later on, have facade as being any face of the building, and that's incorrect. A facade is the primary face of the building. Um, if you go to architecture school, they will drill that into you. I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> that's why we would lose points on our paper. Yes, you did. You would lose points on your paper. Um, yeah, but also you're, you're establishing uh, you know, some sort of standard as well. So, I mean, I think that has to be taken into consideration, whatever that is. How are you establishing that standard? This is, yeah, that's what it used to be, but here's our standard because this is what's going to change it. So. so, I had. I, I a question. Uh, question. We had a question from the public. Can you please? Uh, yeah. Chris Shackroft, from my time in Terrace, Orleans, Ohio. Um, as a developer, the front yard is deeper than the side yards, right? Generally, yes. I think you're opening up a bag of worms here. I think you ought to figure out what's the front yard. And this, if I look at this as a developer, I wouldn't be very happy. I was going to be special on it for a lot. I would think the address. The mailman goes to. My guess is that would be your front. Well, yeah. That's not always mm -hmm. the case. Yeah. May not be. because the mailman is probably going to deposit your mail at the primary street or the most pronounced street, as opposed to have a turn yeah. around the corner. I'm just saying I think you're opening up a huge bag of worms. And the in the back, if you have an alley. So you can't have a garage in that distance? Or is the garage allowed between the house and the alley within that? Yeah, the garage would be allowed. In that front yard setback? Oh, um, no. Well, that was the comment yeah. that I had brought up. Of yeah, how, how do you deal with an alleyway and a garage and something like that? I mean, you're, you're making them lots of smaller than the field. You're only yeah. going to be able to So, share. yeah, we recognize there needs to be some yeah. tweaking, yeah. <laughs> some additional. <laughs> Well, front always gets to be that greatest setback, you know. I, I'm, 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 I'm all for standing with the, staying with the tradition, you know, that people are already used to. So, so I, I think I'm hearing a general consensus that there should probably not be two front yard setbacks. Yeah, that would be my opinion. Well, Is, am I interpreting that correctly? Um, I'm not 100% behind that, uh, and merely because I like having a uniform yeah. Dare I say street front? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, it would be kind of bizarre to all of a sudden get to the corner and have like a big garage sticking out. Not to mention when you get to the corner and have a big garage sticking out, sideline issues of when you're trying to turn that corner. So, um, wherever I, that garage is, and probably the front. <laughs>
Not necessarily, I know, but but I think you still have to, as you already said, those fronts typically have farther setbacks, so they're bigger. Yes. So that should be the front. So, um, I don't, it's so easy that. I, I, I think the front. developer here has a <laughs> this and sees it, works with the inspectors, has to deal with this every day. I, I think your opinion's absolutely valid, so thank you. Yeah, and then um, to Ms. Bonnie's point, it, this is this, this would be a change from our current practice. We do not have two front setbacks. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So, but what you're saying then is like so right now our side yard setbacks could be like 10 feet. Mm -hmm. right. right. That means when you're at the corner, your house or building could be 10 feet. From the right of way. That is what we do now. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we written in the code. But if you want larger setbacks from the street, then having the front would be two mm -hmm. fronts would be the. Yeah. Or you have to make something special for corner lots. Mm -hmm. Say, oh, this is a corner lot, and we're going to treat it differently. Because I think I said I like to have a uniform. Presence. Yeah, I like, I like, I like uniformity piece myself. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> but clearly, the challenge is, I guess, on, on from a developer's perspective. Yeah. yeah. Finding um, we have a comment from the public, please. Yeah, in the case where you have a corner house and the front door faces one street and the driveway faces the other street, which is kind of what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. It seems kind of odd if you're looking at the street where the, the, the garage sticks out, right? Uh, that that would be 10 or 15 feet or whatever from the street and have the entire rest of the street in between the two corner lots have, say, a 30 setback, 30 foot setback. I mean, it just doesn't. It doesn't smell right to me. And I think that's a different issue than the one we're trying to figure out in Alley. Because that does not seem reasonable to have two front yard setbacks on it. But on a corner lot, I think it really does. Go ahead. So, uh, as I said, that, that is what I was wondering. Are we talking about? 205A or 205C, because 205C is what is a problem. Mm -hmm. right. I see, not 205A. Sorry. Yes, 205C. Yes, right. <laughs> so we're, we, in general, we've been talking about 205A, but we have touched on 205C also. Yeah, the C is a problem because of alleyways and other things. A 205A for future development could be a good thing because it creates uniformity. On the front lot. Now, if the problem is redevelopment, I'm, I'm going to take a bad example. Sorry for this, but I thought about it a particular common lot house. They have to be redeveloped. Mm -hmm. They come close with a plan. They used to have just 10 feet setback. Now they have to have a 30 feet setback. That is a problem because that's a redevelopment at that point. Right? Yeah, I, I can see your point, although it, it would depend on the situation. Uh, again, because we're keeping the plan districts in place, it, presumably that would not happen unless there's a zoning change. Mm -hmm. And there, you know, obviously we want we want to try to craft the rules so that they're they're fair, they create standardization. Uh, but there are going to be unique situations yeah. in the future, and that is what uh, variances are for. Yeah. Uh, when there are unique situations that uh, you know the the zoning rules didn't just take into account. Uh, so there, there are always going to be those oddball situations in the future, no matter what rules we craft. Okay. In that case, then, 205A should be okay. 205C, I think we can. Probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah manage, it, manage it with yeah. whatever variances that you need, and I guess you get your you know, confidence level of 95% of those that come in will fit into this box and will fit fine. That other 5% will have to manage it to go forward. So I'm okay with that. So we'll do it. 
The, the zoning resolution also has a section, we will not get to it tonight, but it does have a section that deals with non-conforming uses, lots, that sort of thing. Okay. So it, there are, um, you know, that valid concern of somebody had something today, but they want to change and they're not going to be able to meet these setbacks. Um, there are processes to um, at least help them get through the process without having to use them. So um, before we leave rules of measurements and calculations, I sort of had two questions. Uh, one is the building height measurement. Um, we've always done it, I know, as to the highest point, like the ridge line of the roof, if it's a, a gable roof or something like that, and if it's a flat roof, it doesn't really matter. Um, other jurisdictions do it midway. Um, so I just thought I'd just point that out. Um, so sometimes when you have um, people that come in who normally don't develop in our township and develop, say, City of Columbus, and other jurisdictions, it is the midline or the average of the height of the roof. So especially if you have a specially steep gable, they're taking it halfway. Um, so is there, um, has any thought been into changing that to um, be more um, standard throughout the practice? Or I have no feelings either way. Um, I know 35 is generally the residential height, and 50 is generally the commercial height here. So, um, but I'm just referring for other people who might um, work outside the community. Yeah, and I, I don't know what the right answer is. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can tell you, so you're correct. Generally, our current measurement is to the, the tallest point of the building, except except for uh, Evans Farm and certain other plaintiffs. <laughs> I've recently discovered Evans Farm, actually, it's not measured to the, the highest point. It is measured to the average point. Yes, um, um, because they came from the different um, mindset yes. um, of where other groups or other jurisdictions, that is um, how they measure it. Yes. So it, it, generally speaking, uh, I like the I like the average point in terms of I think it gives a better uh, better indication of the kind of the actual height mm -hmm. of the building. The problem is it's difficult for us to calculate. Uh, it, it with the even with the tools and technologies that we have, it, it's difficult to <coughs> measure and figure out. Okay, what what exactly is the midpoint of this roof? And so it's it's difficult from a practicality standpoint. It's, it's simpler just to say, all right, you know, draw a horizontal line at the top of your building. That's your thirty-five feet. Mm -hmm. But there are houses in the township that are over that because they are in a special district that where it's calculated differently. I'm curious whether Zonco had any feeling on that because that's why they were hired was to give us a bigger view of what's going on in the world and well they were the ones who wrote this section and they, they so they wrote it at the top of the building rather than uh, yes okay well it's easier to calculate it's okay. also easier for like an architect or developer just to snap it to the top I, of the ridge I, line of the roof i i trust where they were at with that okay i just wanted to bring it up no it's a it's a good question yeah. uh, the question was actually posed to me recently. Should should the you know if we're going to calculate it to the top of the building, should it go up to forty feet? I don't know if that's the answer either, but it's something to think about. To be there. honest, for single family residential, I'm not concerned about it. The only uh, issue um, people who might have concerns is the commercial that is generally topped off at fifty. Uh, if that, because you could potentially lose a floor of development that way. Most of our single family homes, they're going to have gable roofs of some form or another um, with a ridge line, and generally they're two, rarely two and a half stories. They're mostly mm -hmm. standardized two stories mm -hmm. in our development here. If we were like, you know, in a more dense area of Columbus, you might have the two and a half story, but generally it's two here. It's not an issue. Um, so the one last thing I had about the rules of measurements and calculation, and this is just because I haven't read the whole text, is we used to have in our code um, a definition of how many buildings you could have per acre. 
and we used to get complaints that it was very difficult to calculate buildings per acre on a, on a parcel. Has, is that provision still in the code? And if so, how is that defined? And is this where it's defined or is it defined when they're talking about the individual districts? So that would be done uh, through, and essentially it's, the, it's similar to the standard that we have now, which is, uh, and it, it depends on the district. Mm -hmm. uh, but what we have now, for example, uh, I think in a single family plan resident district, <laughs> in most districts, uh, you can't cover more than 35% of your lot with structures. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that would be the way that we're looking to regulate it in the future. Uh, it is a little confusing because the calculation swaps, uh, so we're looking at it, you know, now it has to be 75% open space threat, you know, on a lot rather than no more than 25%, so the, the numbers flip, uh, okay. but I think we look to regulate it that way rather than building density, Okay. which so is separate from residential unit density. Okay, so we've removed sort of that density requirement that we had or in our yeah, and, and so and that was difficult to calculate. <laughs> and we so we do have uh, we have in this measurement section uh, the floor to area ratio. That uh, I saw that. Which uh, the only place that we had that was in the uh, Route 23 corridor overlay district. It's not used anywhere else in the document, so I think that section will be removed. Okay. Because we don't use that calculation anywhere else. Yeah, but Article 21 does have some of that language too. Like maximum residential density. Yeah, so, so residential density, that's dwelling units per acre, which I, I believe is different than what Christine is talking yes. about, where it's buildings per per lot or per acre. Oh, okay. Yeah, but it, there was questions about that, like, you know, I have a, you know, 10 acre parcel, I can have, you know, <coughs> three units per acre. So uh, therefore I can have approximately 30, but mm -hmm. what would happen sometimes is, you know, part of that's not developable because of ravines or wetlands or flood zones. And then they try to cram all 30 units into like five acres. And then, you know, people uh, would bring up the fact, well, technically your density is not three units per acre, it's six units per acre, and therefore it doesn't meet this. And then the counter argument would be, well, you never told us how to calculate how many yeah, units I, per acre. I do think we need to clarify that in the code. Yeah. That is something we have currently. That we, so we do it through gross density, okay. uh, which I prefer because net density so, opens up a lot of issues. Okay. Um, <laughs> To, All right. Wow. So as long as, as long as it's addressed somewhere, yeah. And like I said, I haven't read the whole thing, but I just remember um, Dennis probably has similar stories. No, I, can I, tell. Think, I think you're right. The gross density. But I'm thinking <laughs> yes, because it needs to be written because mm -hmm. somebody could try to pass that by because of the way it's written. So the words here are going to matter. Yes. I, I get it. They, you know. Yeah, we would catch that as zoning, but the words are going to matter. And so that's why we're depending on uh, both um, the zoning planning and zoning department, uh, the consultant, and legal counsel to make sure that it um, makes sense and we're safe. So what's our takeaway take as far as clarifying? Is it a specific section in here that we want to do? or? Uh, I think this would probably be the best section to have that in, but we'll have to, to look at that. It yeah. could possibly be in Article 21. But yeah, that, I wasn't sure that's what yeah. I thought, because this excellent point. This has rules of measurement and calculation, so I thought it might want to be here, yeah, as I, opposed to in each individual <laughs> zoning right. district classification. Yes. <coughs> it's to have it under the umbrella of the whole code. Yes if we're talking about setbacks and all that other stuff, definition of what it says. Can you clarify what is gross density? So, uh, so gross density is uh, when, so we'll, we'll say somebody has a 10 acre parcel uh, and the, the density is two dwelling units per acre. So gross density is all the, the acreage of that parcel is incorporated. So that 10 acres, which gives them uh, 10, you know, or sorry, 20 units total. Net density 
is where you subtract, in order for that density calculation, you subtract the land acreage that is not developed. So if there's, if there's a ravine, if there's a stream, if there's a road, then you take away that acreage. And so out of that 10 acres, you have uh, 6.83 acres that are developable. Uh, and, you know, and, and then you calculate the number of units allowed uh, based on that. It's important. The, the, the tricky part is it's difficult to define what is developable. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. so if you have so like, the wetland or you know, so floodplain. The growth story, <laughs> story is take the whole, mm -hmm. whole amount and you know, whatever you build on it, you build on it. You've yes. got six, six, six acres left and Unless you should build X, then on 10, good luck. And then that other, you know, you build on five, and then the other five becomes right. open space, dedicated open space. Yeah. Should there be an example of that also, like, grossly aspect? Because if there is well, a 80% well, you know, the undeveloped land, and then there's the just 20% of it that's developed. And you stack everything in that thing. That's what we're saying they have the right to do. Right there. Yeah. That's what we're recommending. I'm just asking. I mean, I, Me I, I, can, I can see both sides of but, why. Well, that's what we're talking about. If you make this net, then you make it just for developable land if you have that situation where a road or a ravine mm -hmm. for this 10 acres, you know, yeah. We don't want to allow them to stack all that right. stuff in and cramp them all together. Right. And it probably get caught in zoning anyway. Hey, we're not going to allow this. But just, just to put the language in, it stops all the arguments. Right. It should be for developable yeah. land. It should not be just the growth if the growth is all uh, developing. But, uh, but, so but, the but then the we, issue is, I agree, is how do, how do you define what's on the land and what's on the developer? But if you know you have a but, ravine running through, are you going to develop on that ravine? You possibly could develop a house that stretches across the ravine, which is allowed. I mean, to me, the developer know what they can develop. Right. They know what they can sell and what they can buy, right? What people yeah. can buy. Yeah, I mean, what it's, what we I think what our current code suggests. I, I say suggests because all of our projects are planned districts. There it was in a, the code for the cluster situation. So if you have ten acres and only two acres are developable, there was some type of standard that said only X amount of units can still be per mm -hmm. acre. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know that so that's a way to like reduce like, you know, having 40 homes in one spot. Right. But yeah, to Robin's point, to calculate what's undevelopable versus developable, even if there's a ravine, you know, what is what is the space around it? I mean, it's 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 yeah. hard to designate. Yeah. Um, and the other thing too is there are, there are different standards that they still have to follow. There's minimum right. lot size. There's exactly, there's setbacks, set exactly. So as soon as you bring this so into developable land, it's, 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 it's going it's to exactly, it's gonna show up. It's going to show up in an instant as soon as they bring the plan in yeah. and put the buildings on the plan like, and what the setbacks yeah. and the distances are. That, that's why that's always going to get caught in all situations. So uh, it's, it's so not really a, a, a big issue. Right. I think we have a member of the public who wants to speak that might be able to add some insight into For this sure. uh, discussion. So, realistically, Robin, <laughs> you're in a net situation, if you've got a nice wetland area, it's beautiful. Nobody wants to touch wetlands. Okay. Trying to get through EPA to touch a lot of wetlands. It's not worth it. Not gonna last. You're basically pen penalizing the developer by reducing the two acre wetland in your example. Now you're only allowed 16 units for the 10 acres. So now you're saying to the developer, well, you can only, you're developing less in this new code than you could have done a year ago because you're using net versus gross and you've got to have green space anyway in the development mm -hmm. so why can't you use that wetlands as your green space mm -hmm. and yes you're going to stack more units together but you're not going to get any developers that are going to go for this and develop up here if you go with net but, but yeah. the thing is, you're not going to, as we pointed out, 
as soon as you bring the plan in and, and you're not meeting the setbacks and, and the building distances. But it's another step. Yeah, you're, it, it's going to be money to keep going on these stuff. It, it's going yeah. to be out anyway. Yeah. So you already know when you're going to develop this, or I want this many buildings, but I also have to ad ad adhere to the setbacks and distances and roads between them. So it's already going to limit you what you can build and what land's available. I get that part, but you're, you're starting out with far less going with net than gross. Just yeah. out, no, out the recommendation is to go with gross. Yeah. I think we want to go with gross. gross. Yeah. Okay. Just because it's gross. difficult okay. to okay. define what because you because you already know what's going to happen as soon as you have this property. Yeah. I thought you were going with the net. No, no, sorry. Okay. no, sorry, pro gross. All right, so you're good with gross? Yeah, I'm good with gross. Okay. <laughs> then let's go with gross just for the reasons. Yeah, but I, I think the, the commission's point stands there. I don't think there is clear language in the resolution, yeah. the draft resolution that defines okay. that. So yes, that yeah. be it. Quantify it. Let's move on. Everyone good? Yeah. Okay. Just to circle back to 205C, 2.25C is not a plan, right? Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't think that's an issue. No, no, no. It would be a draft that would happen. I think the, the signage measurements, I think we can leave until we get into the, the signage section. And then the rest of Article 2, I, I think it's just the rules of interpretation. I don't know that we need to spend any time on that unless anybody wants to pull something out to discuss. Anything else before we move on to We have a lot on um, three and four. So uh, three is the definitions, uh, which I um, I have some that have been added. Uh, I don't really know that I we need to discuss any unless you have questions on specific uh, items. Can you point out those that have been added? Yeah. yeah. So, and then I have comments. So. I, I it's figured sorry. you would, so, What was that? Uh, I figured you would. Uh, so the the new ones are the. I, I didn't pull out an exhaustive list, but uh, adding architectural terms and definitions. Uh, so Christine can correct me because that was you know, my, my Google research is I'm not an architect. Uh, <laughs> so I did my best, but uh, I am happy to be corrected. Uh, we did also add definitions uh, for uh, solar uh, facilities and then for marijuana facilities also. So okay. those have been popular uh, topics. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Other than that, there's really nothing new since the last time that we uh, went over these. Uh, so again, I didn't have any that I particularly wanted to discuss, but I wanted to call your attention to those. Happy to discuss any of that you all. Thank you. Do you think copy the definitions I wanted to know what is, uh, as previously defined, there was a question on Concrete pads versus um, pavers. Yeah. Pavers. So, have we clarified the definition about the difference? And yeah. So, I, I don't think we. I don't know if we strictly define it uh, in the definition section, but we. I believe we do have uh, in the permit section the concrete uh, and anything that's permanently fixed to the ground. It might have been in the definition for structure. Uh, Essentially, paver patios would not require permits. Uh, they, they do not require permits currently uh, because they're not permanently fixed to the ground. They are, in theory, movable. Uh, but concrete 
you know, a concrete patio would. What about uh, addressing the paver driveways? Yeah. Like, are we allowing those now? <laughs> uh, they are. They are permitted with uh, approval from the fire department. Okay. Oh. They are everywhere, but our code does not allow it. So it just. That. <laughs> that is why I'm asking. Because of it. Yeah. Yeah. And because they don't have to have setbacks. Of those, mm -hmm. and that is why I'm asking. I see yeah. them everywhere, and they are well, they can redefine paper as not permanent, but then they are sealed, they mm -hmm. seem almost permanent. So, I mean, they're pretty, and if they, people keep you know, they're they're nice, but our code mm -hmm. doesn't allow it right now. But we, it, as far as enforcement goes, it's nearly impossible to address any of that, so we wanted to keep that optional, but. I guess for the commission's point on the definitions, I mean, throughout your time being on the commission, has there ever been a question of, you know, what does this mean or, you know, what is, should it have been a definition? Should we have defined it? You know, what are, what are terms that you've thought of over the time that may not have been clear to you in the past? So, I... Mm -hmm. No, I was going to say, go ahead. Okay. No, I was thinking about the, uh, the last one you had. Maybe you had a question on what's the definition of something. Oh, it was the uh, buffer zone. Buffer oh. zone, yeah. Did we, uh, did we come up with that one? Yeah, so. It's not in the data. Yeah, I don't know if it's in the definition, but that, so that's tackled in the 21. Um, okay. So we can look at adding a definition if that's not covered. So buffer yard is so 21.09 is that section. What, 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 uh, okay. Maybe we might want to bring it to the definition. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's not a bad idea. Because yeah. <clears throat> I thought she had an excellent question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Personally. All right. Do we have any other yeah. from the commission? Should I start going through mine? You should. Okay. So, you know, uh, <laughs> what was that? Or you know, <laughs> <laughs> what I can do is I can <laughs> just, <laughs> you know, <laughs> scan my comments and give them to Robin. Um, one came up, um, and. Um, I wasn't sure how quite we wanted to define it, um, is you have a beverage brewing and distilling. Um, and then I think you also, we don't have a distillery, but I think that's covered under beverage brewing and distilling, is we had a question once, um, is how to differentiate in terms of size, in terms of, the Budweiser plant off of 23 versus like Olentangy River, it's a matter of scale. Because uh, at one time we were talking about like having uh, a microbrewery and there were issues of defining the scale. Because when you said that it was going to be a brewery or a distillery, some people thought it was going to be Budweiser off of 23, uh, off of, sorry, 71, as opposed to uh, microbrew type place um, so and I notice some cases we do have definitions um, that have to deal with scale usually with like grocery stores um, you know it's a small scale versus like a Walmart mega store but um, the thought being that perhaps we should also have that when it comes to breweries or distilleries a matter of scale Yeah, you looked concerned. Well, I'm, I, well, I mean, uh, do you uh, know the conversation I'm referring to? I yeah, I, I do. But okay. but, <laughs> but but I'm thinking that yeah, yeah. wouldn't the size of the building already determine that? Can can you be 
a large brewery in a small building? Can you know? <laughs> All right, it took me a minute, but I found it. We do have, uh, so it's uh, under microbrewery or micro distillery. Uh, the cutoff is 20,000 barrels per year or less. Okay, so how does microbrewery and micro distillery relate to industrial heavy, which also has food and beverage processing, relate to beverage brewery and <coughs> distilling? Because you have three definitions there which sort of overlap. This is a good point with the industrial. I had not caught that. So that was just. So maybe looking at the brewery I distillery would, stuff as a whole to make sure they don't conflict with one another. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just taking notes. <laughs> so that's the first one. Okay. Just to make sure there's not like a loophole or there's a conflict. Okay. All right. Second, this is sort of an architectural thing. Great. Carport. All right. I know, you know, everyone thinks of a carport. It's, you know, an element that doesn't have side enclosures other than the side of the building to which the carport is contiguous. So does that mean... Yes. Okay. What was that? Like maybe have a clue. <laughs> <laughs> so are you talking about one side, two sides, three sides? Because technically you can have a carport that is enclosed on potentially definitely two sides, potentially a third side. Mm. Yeah, so, but then why are you saying other than the side of the building, such an element does not include side enclosures other than the side of the building to which the carport is contiguous. That is where the language for me gets kind of, are you considering, what are you considering contiguous to the building? A carport is basically almost, it could be just, you know, not have a building at all associated with it and just have, you know, six pylons or four pylons in the ground in the roof. Or it could be basically um, what we might consider a garage, but without a door. Yeah. We can, I think we can do that. So if you want to wordsmith that, I feel like I should call it done soon because you're running out of power. <laughs> so the, the carport, you, you would say a carport would have enclosures, just not all, like if it was fully enclosed, it would be a garage. If it was partially, it's a carport. Yeah. Oh, well, that's what you're saying. The carport may not have enclosures at all. It, or it might not have yeah. enclosures yeah. at all. Sorry, it might just, or it might just really have, have might yeah. have a bunch of columns yeah. with a, a roof on top. Yeah. So we so they, like, get rid of the continuous yeah. building yeah. story. Yeah, you call yourself a car. Yeah, we just not include it. So whether or not it's attached to the building, this is what we're calling a car. Space outside. Yeah. If it has a garage, if it has a door on it, we're gonna call it a garage. Yeah. You should see John. <laughs> yeah. I did refer. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, do, 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 do you still teach or do you I just practice. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I, I can't see that, that there will be a challenge to this. I mean, like, there would be a problem here. Uh, the, well, my only concern is with the definition, the, it yeah, might yeah. not allow, like, existing carports to be considered carports. Because right. it says you have to be attached to some building. Right. Or, or you can only have like um, what side is contiguous to the building because like branch houses uh, throughout history, you could have a carport that was like had a building on three sides. Yeah. You know, the front would be, you know, the main house. Okay. On the back, you'd have like the utility room or you'd have like the den. And then on another side, you might even have a storage shed. I was yeah. wondering whether the word is attached or detached were relevant in this conversation. Also, whether you could define it in terms of number of open sides. Uh, you know, a, a garage that just doesn't have a door on it, is that really a carport or not? But if it's got two sides open, mm -hmm. clearly it's a carport. Or maybe just all it really needs is one side open. We can, we can tweak it. So I would just say yeah. tweak it yeah. so that um, any existing carports, uh, especially ones attached to ranch houses, would still be applicable. Yeah. 
We don't have a definition for garage either. I don't know if that's. Uh, I need to touch that, but we probably Sorry. want to add that in because uh, a garage could be a, a attached or detached. Mm -hmm. So I would include both definitions of garage. Thank you, Michelle. Oh yeah. Well, I mean, I only know say because you know we talk about this. I mean, <laughs> this is a living document. You know, I think over time too, we'll we might find come across so we should have added that and you know that's that's what the whole thing too like I mean we're going to try to make this as perfect as possible getting through the to the trustees but um so anything we can catch now great but if you know if there is something later down the road that we're like man we should have added this that you know that's there's no problem making amendments in the good. future good all right so the other thing under um I'm just going through alphabetically um actually I'm in with the D's for data center <laughs> We don't have a definition of data center. And the only reason I bring it up is because there yeah, was a potential. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had a discussion on that. And well, there was a potential to have a data center here. And Dennis knows what I'm talking about. And there was a big hoopla. <laughs> and, and I, um, with other things like Intel and other things coming to the area, I think we ought to have that. Uh, the other things we have drugstore we don't have and I don't know how to address it because um, a dispensary uh, uh, drugstores a dispensary is different than a no 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 I'm quite okay. aware of that oh but I think we that was a new thing we added right. um, I don't know if it's in your so, well we have a marijuana facility but the marijuana facility is medical marijuana cultivator or processor yes so because not a dispenser and I, I think I can clear this up and there is there's a reason that it's not because they're supposed to be in the zoning resolution. Right. So the uh, the Orange Township trustees have passed a resolution which is exterior to the zoning resolution, which classifies uh, marijuana dispensaries as retail uses. Okay. Uh, so therefore, it would be covered under the, the retail uh, section of the definition. Oh, so, oh, so it's the so uh. uh Dispensary in that sense is considered a retail place. That's correct. Yeah, but, but, but permitted. They're, 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 they're talking about because that's why they call them the dispensaries. The processors and the cultivators where they're growing it, going on that. Yes, and so that's why we do have our definition of marijuana facility is the the cultivators and processors. Right, exactly. To uh, distinguish those from the dispensaries. The dispensaries and the dispensaries are grouped into retail. The retail. Okay. Yes. All right. It doesn't seem to ask the question. Yeah. It makes sense we just to just add dispensary and then, yeah. And okay. those are all fully permitted in the new code? They are permitted uh, per oh, well, anywhere where there's retail. It, through zoning, there, I, I, so the resolution that the board has passed has said that there's a limit of two dispensaries in Orange Township. So okay. Is, the uh, here already? Uh, they're, they're in the works, that there are two that we have, that, yeah. <laughs> Bad idea. I, I think I, I, the, the places I've seen those in, in the cities where they, I've seen those, it's not good. At the end of the day, it's not something that we want to have as a permitted I don't re, know re, 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 retail I, use. I understand where you're coming from, but I, I don't think we can prohibit them. We it's might not, not be able to. Much like any adult industry. I, I have seen these in Denver and seen where these are at well, in the neighborhood. Yeah, they, they don't have a lot of loitering all around. Yeah, yeah. People not go all in. Right, you have to fully restrict them. Well, I guess I'll just, I mean, not to, I, fortunately or unfortunately, that that, that was a trustee decision. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you done know, that deal. is a right. done deal, yes. I, I can legal counsel. <laughs> Sorry. So, uh, right. I'm just trying to what we are allowed and not allowed yeah. to do yeah. for, like, like I said, other adult yeah. industries. Right. It makes sense it's, to, it's, to your so question right. about dispensaries, it, it's valid, and so it makes sense to put the definition okay. in. Yeah, because they could mm -hmm. amend the resolution to allow more and change it, you know, okay. so. But, yeah, I think they should allow more. <laughs> of course, I take a step Number back to data centers. Uh-huh. One of the things that many communities have been very surprised by when a data center goes in is the noise level. It's generally unexpected. They're generally very quiet. Hmm. But when the power goes out, they have backup generators that are exterior to the buildings. Mm -hmm. And the one I'm 
I'm thinking of in particular is, I think it's true in Boulevard and Hilliard, where a fairly large data center went in. I mean, like 10 buildings worth. And when all of those generators are running at the same time, the level of noise for the surrounding residential areas is just unbelievable. I mean, it shouldn't happen very often, but it's a consideration. Well, the other consideration with that is they have backup generators. Those backup generators periodically have to be tested to make sure they're in working yeah. order for when there is a power outage. Yes, as but well. generally they're only testing them one at a time. Mm -hmm. It's when there's an actual power outage and they're <laughs> all ramping up at the same time. That's when it becomes a, a major issue. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was saying that we should have definitions of some of these newer building types, yeah. if that makes sense, in our code, so that if a developer comes along or a group comes along and wants to build <coughs> one in our community, we already have the framework in place uh, in terms of what is allowed, not allowed, where it is allowed, perhaps an industrial corridor might be better. By, right. Um, I, I mean, this is a specific example of a larger problem that I would hope that the new code would address, which is one of adjacency, where uh, we've had hearings where somebody wanted to put a car wash in directly adjacent to a residential property. And the amount of noise from the blowers and, and all of that, there's just nothing in the code about that. There's no, there's no buffer uh, requirements, uh, and so if, if we worry about light mm -hmm. spillover off commercial property, we don't so much worry about noise, mm -hmm. and I think that's something that's significant that ought to be addressed somehow. Mm -hmm. Just what did the buffer zone be out adding something? Yeah. Industry, yeah, our code really doesn't have any landscaping standards. Um, we, we just refer to whatever is set in the plan district. So this will be a new thing to have uh, proper buffer zones and landscaping we can actually enforce. Um, but I guess, again, just to remind the board and the audience, you know, when we talk, talk about the definitions, we're not deciding if it's permitted or not. We're just making sure that this is just something that we're clarifying that needs to be addressed within the definitions not this we'll get into the use table at a later date but yeah so adding buffer zone what are the definitions yeah that <laughs> and also uh i haven't seen the data centers i would say add the <coughs> data mining operations these are cryptocurrency mining operations mm -hmm. yeah they have similar kind of setups mm -hmm. yeah, uh, that's what so, i was thinking as well so cryptocurrency cryptocurrency mining operations or it's not only just cryptocurrency but any data mining operations because they will have it large will power AI, needs yes it, will, it is similar to a data center data mining operations is a much more catch-all phrase than data center alone okay um that was all started um so we've added dispensary. Um, I don't know if it's worthwhile to add, and I know you all are going to think this is splitting hairs, uh, pharmacy, in particular compound pharmacy. The so compound pharmacy is not the same, or pharmacy is not the same as a drugstore. But <laughs> it's just up to y'all. Drugstore slash pharmacy. I think compound drive the I got splitting hairs. Okay. Uh -huh. Gas station convenience store. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. True. <laughs> what else you got? Um we already talked about it. The facade technically is the front of the building. There's only one facade per building possibly two if you have two primary streets, but generally a facade is the predominant face of a building. 
usually where the main entrance is, but not always. Um, the front, side, and rear are called faces. So, and then there's our, I, I wrote this down, articulated corner facade, that's, that's something that's... That would be more like if you're um, a, um, a corner and you're like a drugstore or a historic drugstore where you have an entrance on the corner. So, for example... But, like, so that would have to be on all corners? No, just on the, uh, like, a predominant corner. So, like, if you're, um, um, in the past, it would have been a retail store that was on the corner, and you would actually have your interests on the corner. So you would have, like, a corner or articulated. Gotcha. So then the corner of the building is, instead of being like this... Instead of being square, it would probably be yeah. an angle. Or like if it was iron. square, you might have a column there with the entrance on the corner. Thanks so much. Me too. Okay. <laughs> and you can still build them. I did a building like that in Old Town East because it followed the historic building pattern that was established that way. So, um, your definition of wrought iron fence is technically a decorative metal fence. <laughs> well, we found that definition somewhere. <laughs> And I will get you the architectural definition of a foot candle, because a foot candle technically is a mount of light that falls within a foot of the blah, 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 blah. Okay? So, and that is only applies to uh, when you're dealing with photometrics. I assume that's why you have it in here. Okay. Yeah, so there is an engineering architecture definition. All right. Um, when you have ground mounted solar energy systems, I would tweak that definition because right now it sounds like you have to be on the ground or above the ground. So if you're above the ground, then how are you ground mounted? You would still have to have a substructure on the ground as opposed to roof mounted, which I don't know. So roof mounted, I believe, is covered somewhere else. I believe so, but I just wanted to double check. It's called rooftop solar array. Okay. But we can we can clarify to say that it does not the ground mountain does not include rooftop solar. Okay. Yeah. Similarly, there are ground mounted or roof mounted wind. Well, that was another thing I was going to add, is that we have provisions for solar energy. Do we want to have provisions for wind energy as well? Especially since we're in the Midwest and there are wind turbines or wind farms. Mm -hmm. um, not that we want one here in Orange mm -hmm. Township, but we might want to have definitions and I have no problems with maybe like one small windmill on somebody's property but a wind farm with large-scale turbines is another discussion. I don't either, I mean, I'll be, I don't think there's space. <laughs> so, I think that was why we didn't add that but... Um, okay. There is a company I know of called Tulip, spelled the way the flower is, that made Residential vertical wind turbine. Mm. And with an average residential lot, you could put one or two or three of these things. You could mount them on a roof. So it's becoming a thing. It's not common, but it could become common. I, I'm going back to solar. That is wall based at solar mm -hmm. right now. Uh, yeah. That is. Um, we lost a company to Indiana that does produce all of that. Or there's also what I call like um, carports or shady. Carports, yeah. Yeah, where it's not attached per se to a roof, but yeah. it creates its own roof. So if we could have considerations such like that, um, I will get you a definition of mezzanine. Because right now your definition of mezzanine sounds like a floor. Technically, a mezzanine is, does not inhabit the whole floor, but a percentage of a floor. Sounds good. Okay. Because right now, you know, it's... And there's one like in the um, 
Ohio Building Code code that tells you what a mezzanine it defines it because it's not a full floor, it's only a partial, and it has to be a certain square foot percentage um, based on the footprint of the building. Because um, if not, you could just people with the current definition could add a whole other floor to a building and call it a mezzanine, um, which I don't think is the purpose you intend. I don't. <laughs> I'm sorry, Dennis. It's all right. <laughs> I don't think we've ever bumped into that. <laughs> In my 18 years here, I've never we've never bumped into it. Gosh, we might. Um, yeah. it, would, it would only be for generally it's considered for commercial or industrial. I got you. No, no. Yeah. no take care of the details. That's all good. Well, and a lot of these definitions, too, you may never face, but that's from okay. like a permitting standpoint, no, no, we're no, trying no. to understand. I, I, I agree. Take care of the details. Yeah. So that's not, nothing wrong with that. What else you got? Um, I would work on your definitions of all your overnight lodging. Because um, it looks like there's some sort of, you know, you have bed and breakfast, I understand, boutique hotel, you give it a number of rooms, which is perfect, you have motel or hotel, and then you have transient hotel, and that's where it gets confusing. Because your transient hotel definition includes... Hotels, motels, motor lodges, bed and breakfast inns, which I don't even think you have a definition of. So I would just tighten up your definition there. So it's clear what you mean when you differentiate three, so there's no confusion or overlap. Mm -hmm. And then if you bring up in, you should probably have a definition of in. I'm sorry. Don't be sorry. <laughs> <laughs> So um, I will give you a definition for pilaster. A pilaster is not a column that's embedded into a building. A column that's embedded into the wall of a building is an engaged column. A pilaster is technically square mm -hmm. or rectangular. Thank you. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> pilaster. It's technically square. Um, or or rectangular, yeah. but yeah, um, and, and then a column that's embedded is a columns are round, piers, pilasters are square, or rectangular, rectilinear. I guess is another way you could call them, as opposed to columns are round. Yes, I could be on the <laughs> So I wasn't I'll take architecture for two hundred dollars. I wasn't going to touch the sign stuff. We could have that conversation when we go through signs. Um, I'll get you an architectural definition of, of a stoop, because a stoop is not a staircase. It's more like a, a porch with steps. I, I mean, I don't I just, we haven't, we didn't create these, so I, I don't know what our, you know, if there's like a standard code for these definitions, but I think it's a, um, I just don't know a how. A planner and not an architect. That's okay. I will not have my feelings hurt, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be, I mean, I do not know what to we'll do this, but our, our definition <laughs> yeah. as by the architect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Rob and I already had this discussion earlier <laughs> when we went through the code with the graphics and stuff like that. Um, so. But I will get you, um, or I will let you borrow. I have several architectural dictionaries. Great. Okay. He'll awesome. read them on his free time. Yes. Hey, some of them have really nice illustrations. If you're it's, it's like a picture book. So um, yeah, and then then if we could add, um, and you might have better ideas of like you know. Data center, data mining center. I know we have some telecommunication stuff as well, but um, if you probably have a better idea of what's coming down the pipeline in terms of with Intel and all the other assorted stuff, I would suggest that we add them. And I think I've talked enough about definitions. So <laughs> I suggested adding a definition for a sales trailer because I know that's come up before because we have had 
codes that only allow um, like a construction trailer and a lot of the developers like to have like a temporary sales. Okay. So that makes sense. But that I didn't. My my list wasn't as uh, architecturally inclined as yours. So I'm glad you're here. <laughs> okay. All right. Any more definition discussion? No, I I am done. I think we should like, need to continue this. The rest of this. Well, I mean, one more thing. All that telecommunications, the solar, all that stuff needs to be added for the future. Because you're what we're writing this code for the next fifty years, thirty years, forty years. Some of these neighborhoods may get wiped out because somebody comes in with a billion dollars and buys them because they want to put this in, you know. And and, and almost anything can happen in the future, and you can't see it. So it it needs to be there, mm -hmm. even though we don't have the land for it today. Mm -hmm. There's no telling. Um, right. And then. Um, All right. What do we got for number four? District. All right. So I, I think, I think Article Article Four we can probably tackle next time because I think that's going to lead us into our our next discussion of going into the, the various di districts and zones. We'll get into the use table, um, <coughs> and I, so I think that's a good stopping point. Okay. Uh, this was good discussion. Move to continue. Yeah. So we will have to. Um, Michelle, can you go to the next slide? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, there we go. So uh, just in terms of scheduling, uh, so because we do have to decide a, a time, date, place, search mm -hmm. for our next meeting on this. So, and this is, it's getting tricky because we have several other rezonings that are coming in uh, and uh, I know we're getting close to the holidays, so everybody's schedule is getting tighter. Mm -hmm. uh, so next week we have uh, a meeting on a rezoning, October 22nd. So I would not suggest that date. Uh, November 12th, we also have a rezoning. That one just came in. I have not sent it to you yet, but okay. I will get it out to you. Uh, so November 12th, uh, we will also have a regular zoning commission meeting. Um, so I would recommend uh, for our next hearing date on this topic, uh, either October 29th uh, or November 19th uh, to continue this discussion. I'm okay with 29. Yeah, the 29 is good. That's two days before Halloween. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You should. You don't have the wrap already. <laughs> <That's not laughs> right? Yeah, I don't like you. What's that? The 29th is not trick or treat. No, no it's, it's on Halloween this year. I think it's yeah. on Halloween this year. Yeah. The 31st. Mm -hmm. So is everybody available on the 29th? And 31st is Diwali too, by the way. So, oh, so there'll be perfect. fireworks somewhere. Yeah, uh, that'll be great. It's the same day. Do we want to? So, what would be the goals for the 29th meeting to review? Uh, so, it would be uh, individual oh. districts and zones and their uses and standards. Uh, okay. So, instead of Article, uh, so Article 4, uh, we'll start with, I mean, we're not going to make it all the way to Article 20, uh, but we'll see how many we can get through. Uh, essentially, we'll go through the, the uses, the various districts and zones, and then probably we can, I think realistically, we can hope to get up to Article 10. Okay. So four, four through 10. We have one that You're probably going to send that out anyway, right? Yes. Because it will show up my calendar if you do that. Yes. Thank you. All right. Um, so can I get a motion to continue this meeting on Tuesday, October 29th at 6.30 p.m.? So moved. Second. Yep. Yeah. Those voting, Mr. McNulty. Yes. Mr. Bells. Yes. Ms. Foster. Yes. Mr. Pierce. Mr. Pierce. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Yes. Thank you, Michelle. Nice seeing you. You too. Thank you for being here.